Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Chakras and Cuss Words podcast. My name is Catherine. I'm the host of this podcast, and today we are talking about everything about the planet Mars that I feel like you need to know in areas of energy, especially when we talk about astrological energy. So let's get into it. This is part of the astrology series. Um, If you haven't heard the whole series, I highly recommend heading over to YouTube where the series is actually as a playlist and a podcast and you could just, you know, start from the beginning and listen to it all because today we're going to only concentrate on the planet Mars. So let's get into it. So Mars, when we think about the planet Mars, it is actually the fourth planet from the sun. And it is named after um, the Roman god of war. So a lot of us, whenever we think of Mars, we kind of think of that area of like assertiveness and a little bit of aggression. And it is seen as like the red planet. It has like this reddish appearance as seen from the earth. And sometimes it kind of looks like a red star. It's also believed that back in the day when people were at war, that a lot of times the the warriors would look at the planet Mars from the bottom of the earth, right? From the earth and pray for them to have powerful weapons, to have that area of armor that shows protection and was necessary to fight a good battle, but it was also necessary to bring them back home. So a lot of ancient, I guess you could say ancient folklore is that a lot of these warriors would actually pray to the planet Mars to have a safe return. Um, The planet Mars represents the number nine. And also it is known as, for instance, the day of representation of Tuesday. Also the planet Mars Um, When we look at areas of the body of the human anatomy that it has like a representation to, it's the areas of the muscle. And that also kind of puts you all in that focus of like strength and energy of, I guess you could say like almost like energy of having that dominant physique. I mean, when somebody has muscles, we think, oh, they're strong. They're consistent, right? Because, you know, we don't just get muscles from sitting at home. You have to go to the gym, you have to work out, you know, you have to work out, you have to work to have this physique. And I think Mars resembles that too, is also putting the work into the area of muscles. And also it is a representation of the metal iron. Stones that represents Mars includes garnets, rubies, and jasper. And the herbs are pine. And um, also we have plants like cedar and holly. So for the most part, when people see Mars in the birth chart, I think they kind of see it as an area of like assertiveness and also aggression. And some of the aggression kind of comes from because Mars is known as being like that fiery reddish type of planet that feels very passionate. Also, some of the things um, that is interesting about the actual planet is it has areas of like having mountains in it and areas of like large cannons that a lot of people know that we have this NASA rover that's going in um, studying the planet Mars. And the planet in a whole is thought to have had some real habitation to it, right? Some real like energy of possibly having life on it. Uh, Mars is actually known for its surface of having like the largest Olympias Mons, which are um, 
a volcano in the solar system and a, like I said, like a huge canyon. So Mars is definitely one of the planets that a lot of us think that if we have to um, leave Earth, maybe we could go to Mars, right? We hear about Mars a lot. Mars also has two small moons known as Phobos and Deimos. And it is um, kind of have this area of exploitation. A lot of people have gone to Mars to explore. I mean, not physically, but you know, they sent the rover and it's always this planet that we're trying to explore because it has this opportunity and curiosity to it. And it also has that potential for life, right? But when we look at Mars in astrology, Mars is a little bit different. It has that potential of life, but it also has that potential of aggression. Mars is also associated with having a high influence on energy and passion. So for instance, like, um, let's say your Mars is in a zodiac that is centered around um, maybe your ninth house. Let's say you have your Mars in Sagittarius, right? So you might have a, like a passion for finding higher wisdom, or you might have a passion for looking at energy of travel, or you might have like this passion of kind of having assertiveness of always doing things that feel very um, structured. Mars is also considered an area that is very masculine and dynamic in energy of force in astrology. It's very considered to rule that area of like sexual drive, um, aggression, and even anger. So we could have like a flip side to it, you know? We want to be assertive, but we don't necessarily want to be overly assertive. And what's interesting about Mars is Mars is actually known to have that energy of having like a little bit of space of like, I guess you could say almost like it's impulsive, but is it too aggressive? But it's also has a strategy behind it in some areas. So I've heard of people tell me like, let's say when Mars was with um, the Geminis, right? I heard a lot of Geminis telling me that some like the first year that like Mars was with Gemini that they felt like, oh my gosh, this was the best time for my business. Like I was so passionate. And of course it depends on, you know, where Mars lies in your chart exactly. But I've had a few Geminis tell me like Mars really helped me um, in areas of finding like a strategy and finding areas of like um, assertiveness to doing certain things. And if those certain things were like creating a business, it made sense, right? Because Mars has that spontaneous, masculine, fiery energy. Also, Mars rules, for the most part, Mars rules Aries and is exhalated in Capricorn. So when we look at that, we see that Mars is feeling comfortable in that energy around, I guess you could say hard work, and also putting one foot forward and then moving towards a path. And so is the Capricorn. The Capricorn's known for having that practice of working hard, of kind of having that drive that maybe somebody who um, doesn't really feel the passion might not work so hard to have certain areas, right? Or have certain successes. Mars is also um, seen sometimes as, I guess you could say, the receptive energy of Venus, which is known as being very feminine and passion, almost like that male and female dynamic. It's like Venus is the romantic partner of Mars, right? It's funny, to me, it seems very interesting that sometimes Mars and Venus are kind of aligned with the same zodiac, 
all at the same time. And it makes me wonder, do those individuals have more of a balance of a relationship, especially like, let's say if it was um, in their seventh house, right? Are they able to balance out that feminine and also that masculine energy versus like, let's say Mars was just aligned with a Zodiac by itself. So that energy is very interesting to me. Also, one of the things that I want to say is when we look at Mars, that Mars energy also has that temper, that temper of anger, right? So even though Mars is known for being spontaneous, passionate, it also has that personality trait where you might be like, ooh, honey, that person gets mad. And when we think about the Aries, sometimes I feel like we can see an Aries like blood boil, right? They're beautiful. They're sweet. But ooh, when that Aries gets mad, honey, mm -mm -mm, you can't tell them nothing. Mars rules the zodiac signs of Aries and Scorpio. So in Aries, Mars is thought to be the area of expression and almost like that impulse and assertiveness. While when Mars rules Scorpio, it's a little bit different. It's an influence that feels a little bit more intense and it feels a little bit more centered around strategy and also in areas of transformation. Like what are you changing when we look at Mars and Scor Scorpio? It's a little bit different dynamic where with Mars and Aries, it feels like there's the go-getter. There's that person that's going to go get things, get it done, get it moving and have that space to make things happen. Also, we have to remember that it indicates that area of personality and assertiveness within the self, right? Within that self energy. And to me, Mars centers around the energy of the, also like the solar plex, but also like the sacral as well. When we look at the chakras, I feel like Mars represents the sacral as well as the solar plex that driven, but then also it has that representation of the crown, right? You have to like trust the decisions that you're making. And Mars is seen as a planet of action. Its representation is a driving force that is taking people to their next desires and their next goals. And maybe that's why it feels so, so sacral and solar plex to me. It just feels like it just feels like you have to kind of have that individual space of taking it to a next level, right? Taking that goal to the next level, taking that passion to the next level. You have to move with that initiative. You have to move with that assertiveness. Um, and it's also really seen in the area of the placement and the aspects of the birth chart that it can indicate how one's very assertive with themselves, but also one might be not so assertive, assertive, depending on what the actual aspect or transit is. And then it also looks at how is that person tackling their challenges. And I'm going to tell you something. Honey, when people found out that my Mars was in cancer, I got so much like, oh my gosh, you must be the biggest crybaby. You must be like crying all the time. You must be super sensitive. And for the most part, I think the Mars like in cancer <laughs> kind of has a bad rap. For the most part, I would say I am very sensitive in some things. I feel that I am very empathetic in some things and I do have that energy where I consider myself an empath. I also consider myself very intuitive and that might be because of that Mars in cancer, right? That energy of Mars being aligned with the moon instead of that energy of Mars being so close to the sun where it brings my feminine nature out and also my intuitive and, as one might say, psychic abilities to kind of be shined and spontaneous. While people might be hiding some of the things that they see, like, or some of the things that they feel, and some of their areas of 
challenges, I might be more vocal with it, right? Because I have that energy of wanting to tackle those certain boundaries and want to tackle that energy of the emotional state as well as the personal state. So it kind of depends on where is your Mars, right? Where do you feel those challenges? Where do you feel that assertiveness? Where do you feel that spontaneous energy? Mars is often linked to that area of passion and like sexual energy that we kind of discussed earlier. And it's that area of intimacy, right? That area of intimacy in the relationship and that energy of creating a relationship that feels that desire. And sometimes for couples, it might be totally different, right? Somebody might have their Mars aligned in a Zodiac that let's say is a fire element. So maybe they're very spontaneous. They're very fiery. And then you have a a Mars that's aligned with something that's a little bit more subtle, maybe like an earth sign or a water sign. And it almost feels like a little bit not as intense, right? Maybe that person is not really going through the motions that their partner is going through. Mars is also associated with areas of, like we said, anger. It's known as the planet of war. So the planet of war, what does that mean? It means that there's areas of potential conflict and there's also energies of potential like um, conflict and also how people might perceive and also have a perspective of certain situations. So like, for instance, if aspects coming up or certain transits coming up where Mars is squared with another alignment, it might feel very volatile, right? And a lot of times when I say, ooh, (laughs) I don't know if I'll be hanging around um, out in the community this day, it's probably because Mars is, um, has a square or has maybe a conjunct energy with a planet that also feels very angry and impulsiveness at certain times. And I'm like, Ooh, you know, people are going to be testing each other's emotions. They are going to be having a direct influence on how do we handle this energy, right? How do we handle this energy of frustration? And also motivation, because we have to remember with energies of frustration also comes energies of motivation where people want to not only maybe be a little bit competitive, but also be a little bit assertive and they could even be a little bit aggressive to each other. So sometimes you see that conflict, you see that aggression, and you really see that anger with Mars. It's like... Yes, we all love a fiery, beautiful, lit candle, right? And the flame is going and it feels very romantic and it feels very beautiful. But what happens when the house accidentally catches on fire? There's no freaking way you want to be in that house, right? You want to protect yourself. You want to get out of that house because now it's impulsive. Now it's very dominant. Now the flames are angry. Um, you know, they're out to harm something. They're out to harm somebody. It's very um, aggressive in the fact that it incorporates everything around it and takes this whole energy. It has this physical energy of basically consuming a life in some ways and consuming the energy around it. It is a very um, vital energy and it is also an energy that can feel very physical and it could feel very driven. So overall, the physical well-being of how we treat that fiery situation, how we treat that aggression, how we treat that really comes out with certain times in our chart, certain events, certain moments, and there's probably going to be a correlation to Mars in there somewhere. Um, Also, we have to look at the transits of progression that has Mars, right? So Mars is closely watched in astrology. Like it is believed to be like that period of time where that individual, depending on what their chart says, might have increased activity 
maybe increase change. Maybe that individual is like on their career path, or maybe that individual is on their romantic path where they're putting themselves into this assertiveness, right? To meet new people, to get something done. But also it sometimes believes that there's challenges in the chart or there's challenges in that individual's life at certain times. So it is a good, uh, good, I guess you could say almost like generic assumption that something is happening with that individual when Mars is really aligned in certain aspects of their chart. Um, and of course it affects them different depending on where it is. It's important to understand that Mars isn't always an angry, uh, angry planet, right? The planet of Mars isn't always angry. There's moments where Mars can feel very beautiful, very spontaneous, very lovely, right? When we look at Mars in that aspect. One of the things that I want to say about Mars is we have to remember some of the the legends of Mars, some of the area of movement of Mars, because Mars has its own story. So while Mars has its own story, and what I mean by it has its own story is we have to remember that Mars is really a planet that a lot of people have a cultural significance to, right? If it's centered around scientific exploitation, if it's considered the area of um, possible new habitat in the future, if it's considered an area where there was potential life or could be potential life. Um, it has its own energy that we really hear more of than some of the other planets. Um, we might not hear about, you know, um, Jupiter as much or Pluto as much, but since Mars is considered about that energy of possibly having more area of curiosity and exploitation. It's really considered its own like story, its own center. And there's a lot of cultural significance when it comes to Mars um, in the areas of astrology, but it's also believed to have a lot of personality traits in the individual, right? Like the stories and the mythology behind it um, of people really taking in that energy of passion and that energy of Mars. So one of the Roman mythologies is Mars was the god of war, right? And he held this position among many of the Roman deities of the gods. And he was considered to be um, the son of Jupiter, which almost made him like the area of one of the strongest gods besides Jupiter. We have to remember Jupiter's very big and it's very grand. And Jupiter was known as the king of the gods. And then there was Juno, who was the queen of the gods, right? Do you know that little asteroid that sometimes we talk about? And it was believed that um Mars was associated with the Greek god Ares. And here are like some energies of what it really kind of transitioned, right? So Mars was primarily like, how did Mars get its name of being the area of the god of war, right? How did Mars get that area of having that spirit of taking soldiers into battle, of having that energy of protection and, and that energy of, mm, I guess you could say, taking taking that impulsiveness, right? And how did it have that energy of being the one to create a mass of destruction. Because when we think about war, war is about destruction. It's, it's about, you know, overcoming huge obstacles, but then also leaving a path of destruction behind. So let's get into the story of Aphrodite. And she was known as the goddess of love and beauty. And the planet, or not the planet, well, I guess it is the planet Mars, but the god Ares, who is known as 
uh, god of war and how this kind of Roman Greek mythology began to have this area of anger, passion, and war that kind of resembles Mars. So it's believed that there was an affair of Aphrodite and Ares, and she was actually married to Hephaestus, the, and he was like the god of craftsmanship and blacksmithing. So he was married to Aphrodite, and he had all these skills of creativity, And he was considered attractive. He was considered like a, I guess you could say, a a good well god for Aphrodite since she is considered the goddess of love and beauty. But for whatever reason, Aphrodite was not happy in her marriage. She was not content. Maybe she lost that energy of passion and she lost that energy of intimacy. And Ares, who was seen as very impulsive and, you know, he's the goddess of war. So he's passionate. He's assertive. He's aggressive. He became the lover of Aphrodite. And these two were entangled in this secret love affair. And their relationship was um, basically hidden for some time. And the relationship came with areas of insight of horrible drama and horrible, like a dramatic energy, right? Because they're hiding their love. They're hiding their feelings of each other, right? And they have a lot of impulsive energy and they have a lot of energy that's centered around hiding their secret affair, and also still being able to see each other. So unfortunately, these lovers were caught in the act by Hephaestus. He eventually discovered that there was an affair between Aphrodite and Ares. And there's different versions in the mythology about how this goes, right? Um, But it was considered that they were caught And he was so upset. He was so angry about the betrayal. And he was so like centered off of getting back at them, right? Revenge. And when you're betrayed, when you're betrayed, revenge sometimes feels like it's, you know, something you need to have, right? You need to make that person hurt as much as they hurt you, or you need to um, cause this ruckus in the life of the others. And revenge is, is an energy that can feel very destructive, um, not only for the individual who is causing the revenge, but also for the people who are receiving the revenge. So um, he was very upset and angry by the betrayal. He's decided he was going to take revenge. He crafted an unbreakable And remember, he's a craftsman and he's known for his blacksmithing. So he crafted an unbreakable and unvincible net. This net he set up, (laughs) I mean, he's very meticulous. He set it up to trap them, to set a trap in the bedroom. So when these two lovers went to go meet for their area of passion and their area of seeking resiliation of their love affair is where he set it up. He wanted to trap them because Aphrodite and Ares often met right behind his back. The two lovers met behind his back. And when the lovers returned um, to the home, that he shared with um, Hermephis. They were caught in the net and they were tangled, right? They could not break. And their passionate embrace was literally holding them together, as one might say, right? And the exposure and humiliation that he felt that Hephaestus felt. He called the other gods to witness the scene in the bedrooms. He's like, I caught these guys in the act. Look at that. That is my wife. That is the other god, Ares. And he called them to see it. And the gods included Zeus, Hera, 
and uh, the rest of the Olympian, I guess you could say, um, center, right? The rest of the Olympian gods were just blown away. They were amused and they were even shocked. And to see Aphrodite and Ares caught in the act, the gods were divided in their reactions, though. Some laughed while others expressed sympathy for the humiliated couple. Because could you imagine being tied in a web of an invisible web that you couldn't get out of an invisible trap while you are basically having an affair and you are in a very intimate position with the person you are having an affair with. And then everybody is looking at you and there must be this huge energy of embarrassment, right? There must be this huge energy of just grief and just overall like, you know, you might be disgusted with yourself or you might be disgusted with the fact that you were caught, but everything is being exposed. It's out in the open. You can't run from it. You can't hide from it. It's there. So the consequences besides humiliation is despite the embarrassment, Aries and Aphrodite continued their relationship after being exposed. However, their affair lingered and the union was often seen as mm, very challenging, very tumultuous, and very having a lot of obstacles of what was the center of this because it wasn't a peaceful reunion. It wasn't like they were able to live in a joyous, loving relationship. They weren't able to live in a relationship that felt um, aligned, right? They had this area of humiliation. Uh, they had this area of complex. They had this area of infidelity. They had this area of... Uh, secrets, right? You ever hear about like uh, couples that uh, cheat and when they cheat, it's very spontaneous. It's very passionate because it's hidden. It's something you're not supposed to do. It's the bad thing, but then the couples end up for whatever reason, maybe leaving their other spouses and then their relationship goes to, you know, goes to hell. It's just this illustration of a dysfunctional relationship because it wasn't centered on a loving and trusting and honest foundation. So <clears throat> that is the story of the gods and the goddess and the area of passion, symbolism, and consequences that Mars really plays out in the Aries, of course, right? The area of the Aries, but also that area of consequence, it really plays out in the Greek mythology of symbolism and morals and ethical, what is right and what is wrong. Um you know, we look at betrayal and we look at that energy of anger and war. And that basically is a center of war. That is a center of creating the consequences of an action, right? And when we think about the position of the birth chart and the energy that Mars brings and also strength and challenges, but also we have to confront that area of courage and confidence. And we have to remember that with everything comes this area of what could possibly be disassembled, what could possibly ta be taken away. And whether if we move in a fast rate or if we move in a slower pace that feels more steady, we have to consider that the options that Mars is has this warrior dynamic. It has this warrior insight where it could feel like an attack. It could feel like an adrenaline rush. It could feel like it is very purposeful. It's very centered. So even though Mars and Aries, you know, that area of Aries God creating that energy of this passionate relationship, the husband was the one who ultimately created another assertiveness, aggression, an area of 
um, destruction when he captured the two couple, you know, when he captured the couple. So looking that at that area of attack and look, looking how we can use this energy of our, in some ways, our gentle light to our warrior stance and our power, but not letting it overly consume us, I would say. So having this balance of our Mars energy, our passion energy, our energy that can sometimes feel very volatile, sometimes can feel very passionate, but sometimes can also feel very beautiful and assertive. So looking at that energy as a whole. So I want to thank everybody for listening to this podcast. Um, I will be releasing next week the meditative story of Mars for you to kind of just listen to and wind down to. It's not so detailed orientated, but it's more of a meditative practice. So I hope you guys have an amazing day. Please comment, like, review, and share this podcast to anybody. And Um, who might be learning about astrology or interested in astrology. Also, um, I will definitely tell you that the YouTube is a little bit more organized because it does have that playlist component about it. So if you want to start from episode one of the astrology series, I highly recommend that. And I will put that in the notes. And also, if you would like to support this channel, please head on over to Chakras and Cuss Words website chakrascusswords.com. You can get a t-shirt. Um, I have some chakra bags. I have a bunch of fun materials. I'm currently not doing any readings right now. I'm probably going to take that off my website and just try to revise it over a couple of months. Um, I'm thinking about, you know, maybe revising it to have more content on there, but it's kind of hard updating the content. You guys remember, this is a solo woman's um, <laughs> solo, what you could say, passion project. Um, so it's just me behind the scenes. So it's sometimes very challenging to go out here and like advertise, you know, what's on the website, but I do have some stuff and I'm kind of thinking about like, do I even really need a website? But everybody says you should have one if you have a podcast. I don't know. All right. Well, thank you so much. And everybody, um, thank you for listening. Have a great day. Bye.